ADHD Rewired, episode 435. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host, and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection, and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, you can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Laura Rorick. She is 69 and was diagnosed with ADHD at age 40. She has found her brain wiring to be a blessing and a curse. Laura has been a registered nurse for 48 years and is a pioneer in the field of preventative diabetic foot care nursing, having created a method of quote unquote, nail sculpture that can be both limb and life saving. Uh, she's been married for 37 years, has two daughters, grandmother of five. She's a crafter, designer, artist, former actress, herbal medicine maker, avid knitter, loves sewing, has traveled the world and has colorful stories of being raised on a houseboat. Laura, welcome to the podcast. I am so pleased to be here. All right. So you were, you see, as you said in the, your, your bio, you were uh, diagnosed at 40 years old. You've been doing nursing. Uh, you've been a nurse for almost that long as well, right? Longer, 48. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Since I was 21 and I'm 69. Yeah. Long time. And you, you really, in your field, you really have been a, a pioneer. And yeah. while I don't know how many people are going to be interested in the world of nail sculpture, um, you know, on this podcast anyways, yeah, I think it's, how did you realize or what was your, your sort of impetus for getting really sort of laser focused on something that ha wasn't created? Well, I was hired um, back in 1994 to do, I actually went in for a job interview that was for occupational medicine. And when they told me what I would be doing, they said I'd be cutting diabetic toenails. In nursing school, this is a really sort of interesting fact, nurses are told they cannot cut toenails, that it has to be the podiatrist or it has to be the family member. And 99% of the nurses in this country and in the world do not know how to properly cut a diabetic or a difficult or a weird toenail. So basically, I went in for an interview for one thing, and then they told me this, and I said, but we can't cut toenails. And they said, yes, you can. It just, we can legally, it's just nobody's been taught. So it's not something that nurses do. But Kaiser doesn't care about, you know, the podiatrist having all the foot care. They want the cheapest, you know, person who can do the job. So I was desperate and I said, OK, fine, whatever. So I, I took this job and th at that time they gave me some very archaic tools looking back and really poor infection control. I was just thrown into it with very little training because there wasn't any training in this. And a podiatrist would come in and you know show me what to do. Over time, I seemed to be making a tremendous difference in my patients' lives, which this was in Richmond, California, mostly very low-income African-American community, and I just fell in love with my patients, and they fell in love with me, and I thought, boy, if I can help somebody and I don't know what I'm doing, what could happen if I did know what I was doing? So I had them do a literature search on what was out there in the field for, for foot care and nursing. And I just went down the rabbit hole that I have been in for the past, whatever, 28 years or something. And after a year of working there with these archaic tools, I learned that there were different methods to, to do this, including this little electric file, which they would not let me use at Kaiser because it creates a dust. Anyway, at, at that time, it, you know, the Dremel grinders from the hardware store. Mm -hmm. 
okay, that's what kind of the state of the art foot care tool was at that time. I ended up going to a beauty show and saw that nail technicians had these really cool electric gadgets that they did for acrylic nails. And I thought, oh my God, that's what I need to be using. And then I found out that nurses in Canada, they were using Dremels, but they were only using one kind of tip, this little diamond tip. And I just, once I realized that you could get different kinds of tips on the ends of these things, I went to the um, industry of carpentry, rock, I don't know what you call it. Anyway, um, I went to all these different industries, anybody who made these tips. So I went from using this one little diamond thing to having a variety of a hundred kinds. So there's, it's like an artist, like Michelangelo having a hundred different paintbrushes instead of one really big coarse one. I put this all together and I'm now, I would say I'm probably the master of this in the world. I don't know, so somewhere in the top. I would love to see anybody who's as good as me and see if I can learn something from them. But So I created this field of basically foot sculpture, calluses, fungal toenails are my jam, so to speak. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm like, oh, that was a great and gross pun all at the same time. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so as I'm listening to this, what what is kind of most fascinating and intriguing to me is not about the actual like specifics of what you're doing, mm-hmm. but it really speaks to the idea of one, having a, a growth mindset, right? Two, being very entrepreneurial. Yeah. Like you you saw a problem that wasn't being addressed that needed a solution and you went out and, and found all these different solutions. And I love how you went to sort of other um, in other fields to see what what people were doing that were kind of related, right? Which I really think shows one of the the uh, strengths of divergent thinking, mm-hmm. right? And so you told me when we first met that you have a, um, you know, you grew up on a, on a houseboat, your mom's an artist, your dad's a jazz drummer. Do you think that upbringing sort of influenced your kind of outside the box thinking? Absolutely. In fact, uh I was raised in Sausalito right across the Golden Gate Bridge from uh, San Francisco back in the late 50s, early 60s. It was the real, the beatniks, the bohemians. I think everybody there had ADHD. It was just, you know, Ma- Malcolm Gladwell has that book, Outliers, mm-hmm. you know, and he talks about specific groups and that that was the group there. So I didn't seem any different. And that's why it took me a very long time to figure out what I had, but Everybody, you know, thought and did that way. And we were able to just run free. I call it the time when kids and dogs ran free. Very much so. And it seems like there was, uh, as a result, there was very little energy trying to masquerade as normal because what you were doing was normal for in that environment. Exactly. And entrepreneurial wise, I remember specifically, I think I was eight years old. And so this was the beginning of my maker stage, too, is we would take soap and cover them with a little washcloth and put sequins eyes and makes these cute little animals. And we would walk around the hills of Sausalito and I would look at the house. And if it looked like a rich house, I would charge 50 cents. And if it was a poorer house, I would charge less. So I was already doing that kind of thinking. So when you decided to, uh, to start this, this whole uh, industry, right? Mm-hmm. Did you even realize that's what you were doing at the time? Uh, not really. No, the more I went around and saw what other people weren't doing and what I was doing, it became clear that I had something pretty special. Yeah. Cause I don't, I don't know if this is maybe the, the same for you. I know that, that something that I, uh, found that I've experienced is I sometimes don't realize what it actually is I'm doing until it's almost like part of it is in hindsight. Like when I started ADHD rewired, I actually didn't realize that I was actually starting a whole new business. I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, and I look back on that. I'm like, well, of course, it's a whole different model. It's a whole, you know, yeah. and I just wonder how, how common something like that is. Because we do have this tendency to sort of jump in without kind of, yeah. you know, doing all of our due diligence to fully understand what it is that we're doing. Because I think for a lot of us, if we knew the challenges that we would face, maybe we wouldn't, you know, even exactly. consider taking it on. So we just like, we have this idea, we get excited and we go. Exactly. And also I knew when people started taking my ideas and using them as their own and not, you know, like the top nurse, uh, foot nurse up in Canada who was using a Dremel grinder. She had written a book and it had a whole chapter on it. And I went, 
oh my gosh, I have this, we could work together and I could help you and I could do it on this. And she went, oh no, no, I can do anything you can do with my Dremel. And I'm going, no, you can't. You know, it's mm -hmm. a whole, it's like a Volkswagen versus a Ferrari, basically. And then her next book came out with all my stuff in it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it, it was, it's, it's hard being the pioneer because you're ahead of the time. And by the time your time really comes, people have taken all your stuff and that was a really difficult thing for me. And it really made me um, get sit way back and withdraw after, you know, a decade or two of that happening, going, I, I, I this is not right. How, how, how did you re rebound from that? Because I, I think that kind of stuff, it, it's unfortunately more common than we would like to, to think. Yeah. And that can be really like at least temporarily kind of soul crushing. Oh, it, it wasn't. It was years of soul crushing. Mm. And what I finally realized is um, once I got over, because being the entrepreneur and if you had a business mind or a manager, I mean, I could have been a gazillionaire and I probably still could because a lot of people still haven't caught on with what I'm doing. And there is all that opportunity. And I'm kind of at the crossroads of, of that now. But um, I just withdrew. Um, I got into a lot of emotional dysphoria stuff, wall of awful, lost friends, um, and it was terrible. And then I went back and I went, what do I love doing? I love working with my patients. I love making them feel better. It makes me feel better. It's that whole gratitude thing. And so um, several years ago, I just kind of quit all those connections because I had traveled the world. I've been to Canada, England, South Africa, Zanzibar, Nepal, wow. England, teaching all this stuff, you know, and thinking, wow, I'm really on to something. But I, I couldn't manage it, you know, because of that part of skill sets that we don't have. So I just had to kind of give up all that stuff and go back to what was important and then uh, just go back to my own private little clients. And, and then I did end up starting a YouTube channel project street feet. And that was really fun um, where I did homeless foot care in a parking lot at a soup kitchen in Santa Rosa. It started out with me and the dog and two people in a backyard of the soup kitchen. And it ended up to be a YouTube channel with 15,000 subscribers. And one of my things got 4 million views. And I didn't even know how to post YouTubes or, or edit them. I mean, if you go out there, they're still out there. They're just ridiculous. So that was fun, but that also got too big. And then I was supporting it all and I had a nonprofit and I had to just fold all that. I want to get, I want to get into a little bit more of that, uh, but we're going to take a quick break. And uh, just something to leave listeners with on the break here is to realize that you don't have to have everything figured out in order to move forward. Yay. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ARC. ADHD Rewired Coaching, which includes our coaching and accountability groups and our alumni membership community. Congratulations to the newest alumni of ARC 28. We look forward to continuing working with you on doing hard things in our alumni community. And congratulations to everyone who has signed up for our summer sessions beginning July 7th and 8th. And if you missed registration for our summer sessions and wish you had more time, well, same here. We are going to do one more registration event, and this one really will be our final one. As of this recording on Friday, June 24th, we still have five spots left in section two with coach Kristen Martz. That section meets at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. So if you are an early person, this would be a great section for you. And we have only two spots left in section four with coach Kat Hoyer at its new time at 5 p.m. Pacific. 8 p.m. Eastern. And that's it. Section one, three, and five are full, and we are now forming wait lists. To join our last registration event on Thursday, June 30th at 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern, go to coachingrewired.com and add your name to the interest list and get started on your pre-registration process today. Everything that you will need to send to us will be sent to you via email once you add your name to the interest list. Pre-registration submissions are due at 11.59 p.m. Central Time on Wednesday, June 29th. 
There are only seven spots left total, so don't wait. That's coachingrewired.com to start your pre-registration process. Once you've registered, don't forget to hit the RSVP button so you don't actually miss joining our last registration event this Thursday, June 30th at 1 p.m. Central. That's 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Have you ever worked beside other people with ADHD who just get it? What would it be worth to you if you could gain more clarity on what you want out of life, to better understand your ADHD, and to make forward momentum on the things that matter the most to you? In ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups, you'll learn ways to become more aware of your time, plan your days, weeks, and months, and learn how to use your calendar to reflect your priorities and your goals so you can live a more meaningful and intentional life. That's coachingrewired.com to get signed up for our final registration event this Thursday, June 30th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. That's coachingrewired.com. We can't wait to meet you and we're looking forward to growing with you. That's coachingrewired.com. Support for this podcast comes from Adult Study Hall by ADHD Rewired at adultstudyhall.com. There are plenty of ways you can optimize your productivity to get more done using real-time accountability. It's only $19.99 a month and it's free for the first week to try, but you can cancel your membership at any time. We have our themed and guided sessions, also known as ASH Plus or Adult Study Hall Plus, for writing, decluttering, working out, finances, and weekly check-ins. Then we have our session for making progress on art and other personal projects, and a career-focused session led by our very own coach, Kat Hoyer. If you want to join the virtual co-working community for adults with ADHD, we invite you to join us by going to adultstudyhall.com to get signed up. It's free for the first week and then only $19.99 a month after that. Learn more about our Ash Plus sessions, our 24-7 drop-in room, and more by going to adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. All right, we are back. All right, so Laura, um, I'm curious if you could go back in time and your current self could can talk to the younger version of you at that moment where uh, you have that kind of punch in the gut of you had this this nurse up in Canada who was taking your your stuff and claiming it for her own. What would you what advice would you give yourself so you didn't get so derailed? I would probably have a whole pocket full of disclosure forms <laughs> and know more about intellectual property rights and. Also, if I had known, uh, because I didn't know then about having the, um, what do you call it? The emotional dysphoria, what is it? Hypersensitivity? Rejection sensitivity. Yes, disorder. yeah, yeah. If I had known more about that, you know, I could have done some more centering and just, but I was just like a ping pong ball going around and sharing all my great ideas with everybody. And uh, yeah, and there was huge business deals involved in all this stuff, importing equipment from Germany to Canada that I started. I, the, so, yeah, it was it was hard. But in the end, everything I believe everything does happen for a reason or I choose to believe that because it's easier than not. And my life has turned out to be so wonderful. And none of it that would have happened had all those things not happened, I guess. But boy, it was hard going through it. How much for you has acceptance been part of your journey? Because you, you've been, you've gone to, you've been all over the world. You've done all kinds of interesting things and you've, you've have hit your, your uh, fair share of obstacles as well. Mm -hmm. so how do you think it, sort of accepting what is has played into, uh, to sort of your, your life's journey here? Yeah. Acceptance. Definitely. It took me a very long time to get there. And I'd say it's acceptance slash letting go. Mm. I've got that book by the guy who wrote letting go and learned. And I'm still learning about that process about just breathing and feeling and not 
reacting and it is so hard <laughs> to do, but that's, that's what I do. And I have a tremendous amount of gratitude um, for, for my life. And, but yeah, accepting is very important. I don't know about you. One of the, the uh, things that I really enjoy about uh, entrepreneurship is the ability to make mistakes, learn from them, and then trying to share those mistakes to help other people not make those same mistakes. Yes. And that was the, the topic of the, the YouTube. That's what I tried to do through that. So um, let, let's talk about, so one, you mentioned the, uh, you know, having, you know, uh, the, the different legal forums and, and stuff like that. And uh, that is absolutely a lesson that I've been learning myself as well. Like, you know, yeah. get contracts for everything. Cause there's definitely, I have been in the mindset of, oh, it'll be okay. Like people I work with are great people, right? It's like, until things go sideways. Exactly. And for me, the hardest part were these were people that I thought were my friends. I mean, really deep friendships. And then to have that happen, that was the hardest part. And then there was the loss of potential financial gains. And I just had to give up the, I'm going to be, I didn't want, I've never wanted to be rich or famous, but it could have happened or, you know, the potential was there, but the friendship, the loss of friendships and the miscommunications were the hardest part. And, you know, I'm sure some of it was that on, on my part as well, because you know how we have that tendency to, we have, we have a thought in our mind that we want to share and the words come out. We have, they may not even be what we thought, but we think we have said what we have and, and they miss, they understand something else. So I've had to take some responsibility for that knowing now that that kind of thing happens. If you know what I'm talking about, right? Absolutely. You know, it's uh, as, as I'm, you know, continuing to try to grow ADHD rewired, um, just the, the importance of clear, effective yes. and repetitive communication. Yes. There's, yeah. there's uh, I forget what, what, where I read this recently. It was something that was, that was said, uh, you know, you have to repeat the same message seven times for the people that you need to hear it to hear it for the first time. Wow. I like that. Yeah. So one of the, the, uh, the things that, um, that happened in your life is you said you had a nonprofit and then yeah. you shut it down because you didn't yeah. pay taxes. Well, I didn't know anything and I, I changed um, treasurers 5 million times. So I really, I really had no board, no working board. And I didn't know you did federal and state taxes. And so at the end, when I was really trying to get it organized and I learned that I had never paid certain taxes, I just paid a lawyer $1,500 and said, shut this thing down. That was at the time I ended the street feet thing. It, I started having grandchildren. I had five grandchildren, five years in a row. And I just had to let all that stuff go. And actually a really good piece of advice I have and was given and of course didn't follow is that if you have a great nonprofit idea, don't start your own nonprofit. Associate with a nonprofit who does similar stuff or whom you could work under their umbrella and work with them. And that's, so, I'm actually sort of trying to do that presently with um, three different, I'm just volunteering for somebody else's nonprofit now, but I'm trying to get some of my ideas to them to do so I don't have to do them. I could consult, but I'm not taking on any of that. I know it is interesting because I have uh, I, I have some strong uh, opinions about just the nonprofit model uh, in general. Because to me, it's just a business model. Like it's because it's still a business. You're in the business yeah. of providing a service, and you got to you know make the 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 balance sheets end up at zero by the end of the year, right? Yeah. And like it's it involves so much more red tape and paperwork. That like, you know, in my school of social work or of social work, we did, there was no discussion about like business of what we do, right? Which I think is a disservice uh, both to, to clients and to, to professionals. But I think that, you know, we can do good as entrepreneurs, right? And provide a, a social good right. and make a profit and an income doing it. And I think it's important for people who, because I, I think there's a lot of people with ADHD who have really not just good ideas, but really want to like, they want to leave the world a better place. Yeah. Right. Like yes. I, I, I'm in, I'm, uh, I'm in a coaching program right now called 2X and, and one of the, uh, the, um, the creator of this program, one of the things he says is like the definition of an entrepreneur is someone who solves problems at scale. I don't quite understand at scale. What does how to explain? So at, at scale meaning, so instead of just doing, you know, 
one-off kind of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. Got it. So, so that's, that's why YouTube. So, so this is what I came to the conclusion is I hate to say this, but nurses do eat their young. There is that saying out there. Um, I've never heard and, that. What does that mean? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. In the nursing field, it's like nurses are really control freaks it's a very interesting thing. This is all about saving, uh, preventing amputations from diabetic. That That's what it's all about. Mm. If you can cut a toenail properly or, or prevent an infection on the foot, 85% of the over 120 million or whatever it is, amputations a year, 85% can be prevented oh, wow. by proper foot care. That's why this is huh. so important to me. The amputations start with a nicked nail or an ingrowing nail on a diabetic who doesn't have nerve, uh, can't sense their feet and no circulation. They get infected, gangrene, amputation. And within five years, the mortality rate is it's higher than cancer. So th this is why it was so important. And it still is. And I'm still trying. And I have to imagine this is just a, a, a matter of your professionalism and an exposure. Do you ever get grossed out by uh, what you see? Not Really? Because sometimes, I mean, yeah, I have seen some feet that are green that look like alligator skin, but then I look up at the person that they're attached to. And, you know, luckily I'm okay with this. What I could never do is do anything with mucus or respiratory stuff. I would throw up. So feet are my jam. So luckily. Yeah. I had, one you, patient, yeah. I had one patient, nobody had seen his feet in 10 years. He had dementia. He mm. lived in an apartment, had slippers on, and then he got put in a home and the, his nieces took off his socks and yeah, 10 years worth of gross and or growth and gross. <laughs> <laughs> and that to me is that's my challenge. Actually, the worse, the better, because I can completely transform that feet usually in less than a half hour with these sculpting skills wow. and they have new feet and they, it, they are just like, it, it's just unbelievable what I can do in such a short period of time. So yeah. 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 So, I'll have to send you some of my before and afters. <laughs> so you are 69 years old yeah. and I don't get any sense from you that you are slowing down at all. So I want to kind of hear more about, I don't know if you're even thinking about this as like your, your encore performance or like the, you know, I want to hear about what is next for you and how you're kind of managing your, your energy. Um, but we're going to first take a quick break and we'll, okay. we'll be Sounds right good. back. Let's Not hear right. what happens from uh, 69 onward. So we will be okay. right back. If you enjoy this podcast and want to stay up to date with our show notes and weekly episodes, then subscribe to ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast or hitting the subscribe or follow button in your favorite podcast player. And if you love the show, don't forget to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player if that app accepts reviews. Then be sure to check out all of our other shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. We have ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, and ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens. You can also join me and the rest of the ADHD Rewired team for our monthly live Q&A every second Tuesday of the month. We do stream our live Q&As on Facebook, but if you want to interact with us and have a chance to ask your questions live, the best way to join us is on Zoom by going to ADHDrewired.com slash events. Find this podcast and all of our shows by going to ADHDrewired.com and clicking on the podcast tab at the top of the page. And if you want to join our monthly live Q&As, click on the events tab to register so you can join us every month. That's ADHDrewired.com. Thanks for listening. Support for this podcast comes from our patrons. Hey, you can join me today if you are a patron at the $25 a month level. We are going to be doing a coaching call all around improving your to-do lists. This is the first time we're doing a theme-based coaching session. So if you would like some additional support, you can join me and other patrons who are supporting us at $25 a month today at 3 p.m. Central. 
If you want to support this show because you love the podcast and the work that we are doing, then come on over to Patreon by going to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. I want to thank Fiona L, who is our newest patron this week. Welcome and thank you for your support. You can become a patron starting at any amount with perks starting at just $5 a month, where you can get ad-free episodes of the show. Then, as I just mentioned, at $25 a month, you can get ad-free episodes and join me for our monthly patron-only coaching call. And if you are listening to this in the future but want to hear the tips and tricks that we shared this month, then you can get the audio recordings of our monthly coaching calls and our ad-free episodes when you become a patron at just $10 a month. Whether it's for the ad-free episodes, our monthly coaching calls, or you simply want to support this podcast because you believe in the work that we are doing, your support is very much appreciated. You know, this podcast is free to you to consume, but it is not free to create and produce. Our monthly costs are over $800 a month in editing and hosting, so your support does help make this podcast happen. Thanks to all of our patrons, old and new, for your support. Consider becoming a patron over at 88 hdrewire.com slash Patreon. Support can start at any amount with perks starting at just $5 a month. And our support has recently dipped a little bit. So if you are in a position to give, now would be a great time to do so. Go to adhdrewire.com slash Patreon. And thank you so much. All right, we are back. So you've done a lot of stuff. You said you were, uh, you've been all over the world. You were even in, a, you said you had a speaking part in one of the world's worst movies that was banned in the UK. Oh my God, I forgot I told you that. <laughs> yes, and it's on YouTube. What, what's, what's the movie? It's called Don't Go In The Woods Alone. 1980. And what happened was I I did a little theater in high school. I was never good, but I was brave enough to do it. And at that time I could memorize lines, which I could never do now. Anyway, um, one day I just said to myself, I don't want to be in a play. I want to be in a movie. The next week I called a friend of mine and his wife answered and said, oh, Garth's in Utah. They're making his movie. And I go, I want to be in his movie. He was a screenwriter. And I had no idea he had any movie going on. So I called up his producer and I said, hi, I'm Garth's friend. I want to be in the movie. And he goes, well, we have the part of a lady doctor. And I said, well, I have a stethoscope and a lab coat. So um, I quit my job, put everything in storage, hopped a train to Montana within a week. I had a broken heart. So this is a way to get out of that situation and went up and played this part. I got $50. I think I could actually be in Screen Actors Guild because I had a speaking part in a major motion picture. Maybe I should check in on that, see if that's still valid. So I played Dr. Maggie. It's on YouTube. And I think I come in at around minute 52. And I was 27 years old when I was, did that. It was so and why much was fun. the band in the UK? Oh, it was banned in the UK. They had a, um, a, they called it Video Nasties. And it's a special group that were so gross. And it was not that gross. I mean, I don't know. Anyway, so it it was banned and it still is. That and is it's in slasher books. Um, if you look up, don't go in the way. So I think I was the worst actress in the worst movie ever made. <laughs> my claim to fame. And, Didn't give up my day job. <laughs> and you are still uh, here to talk about it. Yes, I am. Um, so I just love the the spirit of like, well, that sounds fun and kind of jumping into it. Yeah. How often has this not turned out so well for you? Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's I don't know what the rate is, probably at least 50-50 or, yeah, the impulsive stuff that I have done over my life has been tragic in some cases. Yeah. So jumping into relationships, jumping into jobs, moving, you know, I did all of those. I moved 17 times by the time I was 17, but that wasn't really my, the answer to your question. But um, yeah, it's often not turned out so good. So I'm wondering too, in, in hindsight, you know, how much of uh, both the, the wonderful experiences you've had as well as some of the uh, jumping before looking both ways, sort of summing it up as a whole, would you say you would do it all over the same way again? Or do you think you would, there's lots of things you would do differently? I, th- 
I think I would do some things differently, but like I said, it all ended up where I'm at. So that's good. But what I did do, what I didn't, because I didn't know what I had, I did a lot of self-medicating, mm. a lot of uh, binge drinking, you know, in my teens and which I, I, I was so innocent looking, you know, I got to, I talked my way out of everything. So I never got, you know, in legal trouble and never got, so I was very, very lucky. And, but yeah, I, I crashed cars. I, you know, I did all sorts of things. I've just been extremely lucky. And I think it's because I was meant to be doing what I'm doing now and have done what I've done, but it, it was hard. It was definitely a roller coaster. So it, um, you were mentioning earlier that you are now a grandmother of five and mm-hmm. uh, the, the smile on your face when you were talking about that was, uh, you know, I, I'm sensing that listeners could sense that smile uh, oh, that was on yeah. your face. How has being a grandmother um, or has it sort of changed how you approach exciting, interesting ideas? Well, I kind of base them around their needs because they're definitely my priority. My family is definitely top priority. And I've met people, it's interesting, who who it isn't. Their career is and they actually, you know, it, it, it's interesting. But the biggest challenge and is uh, my eight-year-old grandson has ADHD. And it's hard to tell with yeah, maybe one, the three or the, you know, there might be a couple more. We, we don't know yet because they range from three to eight. So I do everything around them. Even my the volunteer work I'm doing now, I, I'm working for the botanical bus. It is based on working with the Latinx community in Sonoma County. And my grandchildren are half Mexican. My uh, uh, daughter married a Mexican-American and my husband is New Mexican. So there's a lot of Latinx in my family. And now I'm doing the volunteer work and I got to bring my granddaughter with me the last time. And she participated. We have a prayer group at the Mm. beginning and they sage us and she's getting the cultural thing. So I really try to multitask in a way. And even my artwork, I just um, rented a, a studio in an old funky warehouse that I love in Santa Rosa. And I'm making it into a little art school for the kids. And then we can do artwork that can maybe be sold to raise money for the nonprofit. So I really try to fit it all together, family, work, fun. Um, it sounds like you were like one of your strengths is you're an integrator. Like you bring together, you know, you bring together things that at first glance, you're like, how, how could you connect these things? And you do. Thank you. That's a great word. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. And it just happens naturally. And that's what I, I love about our brains. And I don't know if I heard this or if I made it up, but the way I look at it is in the back of our brain, it's like an open app that's, you know, just collecting all this data And then a couple of days or years later, you know, I wake up at three in the morning and go, oh, my God, you know, so that's I never think about these ideas. I don't plan them or sit down and go, how can I do this? They just pop into my brain. And so I just go with that. I recognize it now and um, and I kind of follow my intuition and it's, it's really fun. I really have a lot of fun. It sounds like you're you're enjoying life. Yeah, I am. So what's next for you then? Well, at the moment, um, I, I mentioned before we started, I've, I've just transitioned off of um, going off my stimulant medications because because I have some health issues. In one way, I'm the healthiest I've been since I was a teenager. I'm working out. I'm at a good weight. I eat really well, but I have this cholesterol weird thing. And so I have to pay a lot of attention to my health. So I'm trying to integrate that with the grandkids, you know, going on walks and things like that. But what I'm doing is trying to still keep these ideas alive with the foot care, but give them to different organizations. Uh, Because the one thing about the nonprofit was that there are so many grants, especially for preventive diabetic foot care. I mean, it could be a huge thing. So the vision I have in my mind for Sonoma County is to get a mobile diabetes unit that has foot care and diabetic education. I did this once um, last summer with this organization. We go to the farms, where the vineyards where they're growing the grapes and, and taking care of people's feet out on the farm. And I love that, but it could be do, done, like you said, on scale. It needs to be done not just that one day a year at that one farm. It needs to be everywhere. So uh, right now I'm trying to get the 
thought leaders in the, um, and I'm just going with the Latinx community here because that's who I've been drawn to, but it also needs African-Americans seeing everybody basically. But I am trying to meet with these people, give them the, the ideas, but very much drawing the line that I cannot make this happen. I can be a consultant. I could be on the board. I can give you my ideas. I can give you my resources, but I can't do the details. I can do the bullet points, but you guys got to fill in the details. So I'm right in the middle of that process now with three different um, Corazon, La Luz, the Botanical Bus. Those are the organizations here. So how do you keep yourself and your time organized? Not very well. (laughs) But luckily, I'm trying to keep foot care to just one day a week because I still have my own clients, which I I just love. Uh, But I am having a hard time with that. I I do am going to do strength training for my osteoporosis. I do the slow strength training and I'm reversing some of my um, osteopenia to osteoporosis. So that fills in some blanks. And like you have said on so many of your podcasts, scheduling, calendaring, that sort of thing. And what I thought I could do when I on the days because I take the Adderall PRN is I thought, well, I can plan all the stuff, then do it on the days when I don't take it. But I'd have a plan for people who don't know what PRN. It just means like as needed as needed. Yeah. So I used to take it like two, two to three days a week. And then uh, I started taking it more frequently because they came out and said, seniors, it's really okay if you can keep your blood pressure under control. But I just it might I I just couldn't do that. So I, I went off them completely. And actually, I, I'm doing OK. I think I think I'm going to be able to do this. But I have a really supportive husband and I don't have to be the breadwinner anymore. I was initially at the beginning of our marriage. He was a carpenter. Now he's a retired superintendent. So I have such support. And um So I'm just going to have fun kind of creating that. Oh, I also hired a professional organizer for two days because my garage is an herbal laboratory. I make herbal medicines, salves, tinctures, all sorts of things. So I have this whole laboratory back there. And then I uh, hired her to come to my art studio to make my children's art school. And I am going to hire a teenager from the neighborhood to come over and help me with all the stuff like open the refrigerator and say, could you please get rid of this, this and this? All those details that I just, the minutia that drives me crazy. So that's how I'm going to handle things moving forward. Delegate, hire. Because it sounds like you have no plans of slowing yeah. down. No, but it's, it's, it's rearranging pots on the, on the fire or uh, the spinning plates. You know, it's just, there are a few I'm letting go of and a few I'm spinning slower. And it's just rearranging things and putting the priorities Actually, the very first priority is, is really is my health because <laughs> I can't do anything if right. I if we don't have that. that I mean, I'm not yeah, anything. and that's where the Wim Hof and I do sauna bathing five days a week and cold water immersion and breathing techniques and so all you're that stuff. you're one of these people who will get into the, the ice cold bath. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. During the pandemic, before I had the sauna. Every morning at 6 a.m., it was the I got up, I marched down those stairs, and I got in. What I do is have a $60 plastic tub in the backyard that's kind of tall, so you can get into it, and the water goes up to your neck. And it would be between 40 and 50 degrees in the winter, and, and as long as it's under 64. Anyway, I would just step into it. And there's that saying, do something hard every day. I did that every day. And now I do it after the sauna. So it's a little bit, you know, more pleasant because you're hot and you want to get cooled. There's an incredible uh, scientist I follow, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, and another one, Dr. Andrew Huberman. And they have vast amounts of information on all this stuff. Ice bathing, sauna bathing, breathing. I'm really into all that. Yeah. Laura, you've had a really really interesting life. You're clearly not nowhere near done. You got so many things going on right now. As someone who is uh, 69 years old, diagnosed with ADHD uh, for um, almost 30 years, um, what would you recommend to to listeners, Um, whether they're early in their life or where you're at? Well, I think the first thing is to absolutely learn every single thing that you can about ADHD. It's like our user manual. If you learn how to use your brain, then you can do psychological judo on yourself. (laughs) 
So that's the big, biggest tip. But also, I mean, it's all about health and exercise and diet, which goes along with the ADHD and just enjoying the moment. And luckily, I didn't get the anxiety disorder that a lot of people get. I just have that sensory processing disorder. But yeah, learn everything you can about ADHD. Oh, somebody, I think it was Barclay or one of those guys said, marry the right person and get the right job. That is definitely, uh, those are really good tips as well. For yeah. sure. All right. So, uh, Laura, your website is? I actually don't have one. I've got the, the YouTube. I know. Isn't that? I can't handle it. The techn- <laughs> I This woman is wor- working with me, possibly on having one, but I don't know that I even want to have one. I, I still have the YouTube channel up. I mean, it's under, if you just go in under YouTube and foot Laura foot nurse or foot care nursing, I have 177 random weird videos out there and I do see comments, but I can give my email address. Go for it. Okay. It's my last name in small letters, R O E H R I C K R N Rorick R N at gmail.com. And we'll post a link to that uh, okay. in the show notes. So thank you so much. This was, uh, man, you, you've been living a, a really just a fascinating life. And I hope that your, your adventures continue and you continue to have that impact uh, on, uh, on those who uh, you care most about. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And has anybody ever, t- I feel like you, I've known you for years because I've listened to you so much. So it's like talking to an old friend. So I just want to thank you because you've made this just a really wonderful experience for me. Well, thanks for saying that. That was very kind. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks 
updated July 2021. Nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keep Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.